We said money, real money, is not the cash. We said it's intangible resources. And the most powerful intangible resource in the world is revelation. That's why there's a powerful connection between your profit and your prosperity. Because there will always be resources around your life, but the prophetic anointing helps to open your eyes to discover your resources. Then you have the basic resources that you exchange at the place of exchange. Because we said money, the cash, is only a means of exchange. Exchange of value. So that's what prophets do. When the prophet, when Jehoshaphat the king realized that, he said, believe the Lord your God. You will be established. Believe also his prophets. You will do what? You will prosper. Elisha the prophet looks at a widow and says, what do you have in the house? She says, nothing but a small jar of oil. He says, go take that jar of oil. Okay, borrow large vessels, empty vessels. Don't borrow a few. Close the door on you. Pour the oil. And when she obeyed the prophet, some intangible resources were converted to tangible resources for her and she got the basic resource with which to start a business. Amen. So as we discuss this starting a business, I want you to understand that our definition in the first instance has to change. What I see prophetically about this nation is it's entrepreneurs that will change this nation. I'm serious. It's people who have capacity to start and run a business that will change this country. Our definition of business has to change for a start. Because when you say business to the average person in this country, it's patronizing government. Am I right? Oh yeah, because it's government that has the money. <laughs> Most of the money in the country is from oil. And it's controlled almost entirely by government. So unless there's a release of allocation from Abuja, everybody is stranded. Literally speaking. That structure is changing. <clears throat> it's not a prayer. <laughs> uh, I'm saying something that I saw in the realm of the spirit. Actually, now that we are saying it, it has changed. What we are here to do is to distribute everybody's share to them. And as far as your eyes can see, so will you get. You understand? Genesis thirteen fourteen, And the Lord spoke to Abraham after the Lord was separated from him. Lift up your eyes. Now look to the north, the south, the east, the west. As far as your eyes can see, so I have given to you and to your descendants. To possess. Amen. Good. So the structure is changing. We're going to have individuals now who are going to be wealthier than state governments. Who are going to be wealthier than local governments. <laughs> so people are listening to me now. Your business, your value, eh, you will be wealthier than some African countries. So when you want to visit a country, you will be given diplomatic reception. Because you will be a guest, not just of the business organization that is receiving you, but of the government itself. Yeah, some people are saying amen, some people are... <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! People who depend on our existing corrupt system for survival cannot change it. Should I say it again? Anyone who depends on this existing corrupt system for survival cannot change that system. So God is raising people through a parallel economy who will be wealthier. 
Whereas the limitations in the environment have been able to stop some people, this group of people I'm talking about cannot be stopped. Laban employs a Jacob and finds out that the Jacob has an anointing that causes him to be prosperous. Laban said to Jacob, don't go away. Because Jacob said, I've been working for you. I want to go and start my own. He said, don't go away. Name your wages. Name anything you want to take. Name it. Don't go. Is that because I have learned by experience that God has prospered me for your sake? Well, in more recent translations of the Bible, the word experience is translated divination. <laughs> I have consulted Babalaos, Habalis. They have told me that I must not allow you to go, that you are the talisman that is causing my business to prosper. So please, please remember. When we started out on this issue of business, I said, okay, even if you won't start an organization, you must have the mindset of an entrepreneur to rise to the highest level because the person who started the organization in the first place was an entrepreneur. When you think like them, you rise to the highest level. In fact, sometimes you invent new divisions of the business that create the future of the business. Joseph worked for, Pharaoh, for Potiphar in Genesis. And the Bible says that God blessed Potiphar for Joseph's sake. That Potiphar himself saw that whatever Joseph did prospered. Because the Lord was with him. When a person has access to intangible wealth, to the realm of the spirit, the person brings wealth to an organization. So, even though Joseph was supposed to be a slave, his mindset and his capacity broke that limit because he was an entrepreneur on his own. He had the capacity to invent wealth. That's what Deuteronomy 8.18 says that God has given us. The power to create, to invent. So what, where other people will be stranded, we cannot be stranded. Because we can see what their eyes cannot see. We can hear what their ears cannot hear. We can see wealth where they see poverty and difficulty. We can see wells in the desert. We can see forests in the wilderness. Because we have access to a realm other people don't have access to. So Joseph prospered. And because he was there working for Potiphar, Potiphar's business was doing well. So while he was supposed to be a slave, they had to change his title. So they said, Potiphar put everything in his care. Any reasonable boss will want to do that. Okay, something happened. Potiphar's wife lied against him. He landed in prison. And he was supposed to be a prisoner, but his mindset was bigger than the prison. So while he was, <laughs> God bless Joseph, while he was there, he, the way he was thinking was on how to run the prison. By the time he gave one or two proposals to the prison warden, or the warden, or the prison controller, the man said, you know what, <laughs> assistant controller, you will hold on. This guy is the new assistant controller. Let him run this place for us. Because he came in with the mindset of an entrepreneur. Amen. Very soon, they will hand over the sports. The area of sports in this country to us. Listen to me. The people who make the most money in sport are not the athletes. They are the owners of the clubs. Amen. So whilst the athlete or sports person has raw talent and skill to use, the person with organizational ability makes most of the money. That's what business is about. Production, distribution, consumption. 
having the ability to organize systems for production, distribution, and the consumption of goods and services. Being able to organize a system for the production, the distribution, and the consumption of goods and services. That's what makes the difference. That's what Joseph had. That's what Jacob had that Esau did not have. That's what the Western world has today that we don't have. Being able to organize a system for the production, the distribution, and the consumption of goods and services. So, eventually they sent for Joseph in the palace. And with his entrepreneurial mindset, he organizes Egypt. (laughs) He organizes Egypt. And during a global economic recession, Egypt explodes with wealth. So there's an anointing. Amen. There's an anointing. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor. And the borrower is a servant to the lender. But that first line, is it? That first line. That's been ringing in my spirit. The rich rules over the poor. The rich rules over the poor. The rich rules over the poor. Think about it. The rich rules over the poor. So when you want to organize the systems in a nation, especially the political system, bear that in mind. Now, the rich, even if the money is stolen, rule over the poor. You wonder why someone who's had a clean record goes into government in this country and begins to amass wealth. He wants to stay there. Because you need to be rich to rule. Amen. The good news for us, now listen to me, governments around the world now are run like businesses. (laughs) <laughs> what you have today are political economies. If the United States befriends you, it's because of economies, because of business. If it fights you, it's business. If it ignores you, it's because your economy does not count. Am I right? <laughs> oh, when people were killing themselves, there was a war in Liberia. And people were asking, huh, you know, the United States should get the war. The United States should send troops. They should send peacekeeping troops. You send troops. And the U.S. was watching. You kill yourselves because why should they waste American lives and billions of dollars over nothing? So they were encouraging Nigeria as the giant of Africa <laughs> to go and maintain the peace. And they killed loads of our people who didn't understand the terror. Then they commended us. <laughs> they commended us for being the big brother. But in Iraq, they will show up because of what? Oil. In these last days, this country will count. The rich rules over the poor. Now that we are redefining wealth and what it means to be rich, then get ready. We're about to rule. So people hear, when you sneeze, the economy of a whole state will catch cold. Not long from now, after church services, some three, four people will get together and have a small chart to decide who will be the next governor in their state. Not everybody is saying amen because it may be difficult to believe. So when we, when we teach how to start a business, please understand we're speaking prophetically. We're speaking 
prophetically. In Zechariah chapter 1, I'm going to run throughout to start the business. But I, I want to lay a foundation. Because I don't want the revelation wasted. Zechariah chapter 1. From verse 18. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? So he answered me, These are the homes that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, or four professionals, or project managers. And I said, What are these coming to do? So he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them. To cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Hallelujah. So when God wants to create a shift, he brings on the scene professionals. Entrepreneurs who will change the equation and change the landscape. This prophecy is about you. The horns that scattered people, put them under slavery, are about to be broken. Listen to me. The anointing that God is giving us now. It's an anointing that has the capacity to displace principalities. Hmm. Someone say amen to that. You know, there was a time when we used to say, oh, if only Christians were in government, things would change. We stopped saying that. Because we saw Christians going to government. Some of them stole more money than people who were not Christians. It's easy for you to sit down and criticize them. If you want to understand what it feels like, go there. Anyone who wants to occupy a leadership position around here must begin to appreciate that he is about to deal with principalities and powers. Rulers of the darkness of this world and wicked spirits in heavenly realms. You are about to superintend over a territory that is under a curse. So don't think it's because they're crazy. There are positions which when you occupy, you can become possessed if you don't carry apostolic anointing. The capacity to displace principalities and powers. Don't go into government if you have not finished your capacity for selfishness. Don't go near there. Don't go near government if you have not come to the point that Jesus came to. That after not eating for 40 days, that when you have personal, desperate, financial needs, God puts within your reach billions. That you don't have the right to take. You have power to turn a stone into bread. You've not eaten 40 days. And Satan whispers to you, use your power. If you have not yet come to the point where, with the intensity of your need, your head and your spirit can still be clear enough, To put revelation first. And put what God wants first. Don't move near there. That's the essence of this series. Because the thing that put Jesus above that temptation was revelation. It is what? Preaching. Man shall not live by bread alone. His definition of success was different. His definition of power was different. It didn't have to do with any position. It didn't have to do with acquisition. Man shall not live by the material alone. 
until you come to the point where you don't define your success by the size of your house, by the kind of clothes you put on, and by the kind of reverence, you know, that people show you around, until you are free from the spirit around here that tells us that to be a successful person, you must be a big man, you must be a big woman. Put those big chains, okay? And have a lot of people running around you to create the atmosphere. Until you are free from that, don't move now. That's not what we're talking about. Amen? But thank God for the revelation. Thank God. (laughs) Hallelujah. That even when we don't have a loaf of bread, we can still be rich. And look the devil in the eye and tell him to get lost. Hallelujah. Silver and gold I have none, but what I have, I will give you. (laughs) Hallelujah. Please listen over and over to these CDs until the revelation, the seed falls into your heart and grows there to produce fruit. It's a new level. Amen. It's a new level. It's a new level. We are free. We're free from poverty. Amen. We're free from the spirit of poverty. And you know what that means. We're free from desperation. We are free from the deception that drives everybody in the society. We are free from pressure. I better pass my neighbor. God bless you. That's what you think. Only God knows who better pass the other person. Hallelujah. (laughs) Okay, you have generator that is making noise. I don't have generator. Power generating set. Congratulations. Amen. So while you are thinking of buying generating set, I'm thinking of changing the country so there will be uninterrupted power supply. Then your generating set will become useless. Hallelujah. Is that okay? <laughs> so while you are thinking, ah, the proof that I'm rich is for me to buy a jeep so that when the whole place is flooded and 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 other people's cars are getting stuck. I can just ride in my jeep. While you are thinking about that, some of us are thinking about how to change the structure of the country so that there will be good roads and good drainage system. Then you can decide what to do with your jeep. <laughs> a jeep, a jeep. You understand? <laughs> Hallelujah! We are free from the spirit of poverty. If you believe that, say Amen. It's a prophetic season. We are coming to scatter the horns that have held people in bondage forever. Amen. (laughs) Okay, so you want to start a business? Um, Let's run through a few of the steps. So, the first thing, get rid of the fear of starting a business. Get rid. So, as long as your definition is being able to have access you know, to a government official, so I can give you contract, okay, and give you, you know, give you supply, give you hanging, and you see, once you don't have access to anybody, you don't have any connection, then you are finished. How can I start a business? When I don't know anybody, perish the thought. The definition of business is changing. When God moves you from Egypt and you're about to enter Cana, you must understand He is not depending solely and entirely on your experience or intelligence. He is about to give you miracles. What he requires from you is what? Faith. 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 He told Israel, I'm taking you to take over cities and nations that are greater than you. Mightier than you are. So the only way to go about that is faith. Deuteronomy 9, from verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than yourself. Cities great and fortified up to heaven. That's what he said. I'm about to possess a line of business that is bigger than I am. I'm about to control sums of money that are bigger than I ever controlled before. Who is ready for that? So the big requirement is what? Faith. 
courage. If you hang around us in this house, pay close attention. Okay, the things we do may seem to be simple, natural, but you pay close attention and you will realize we are risk takers. We have faith. We make bold moves. Okay? Faith. The first step, if you want to start a business, find a business to start. Find a business to start. How do you do that? Remember, a business is just simply a system for the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Identify people's needs. Identify people's needs. Find out what do people need around here. Understand that it didn't used to be so complex when... uh, Economy, global economy was mainly agrarian or based on agriculture. It was simple. Every family owned its own farm. Okay? Every family owned its own farm. It was somewhere along the line that people invented corporations, okay, to limit their liability. Okay? And to give them leverage, Because the scope of production was beginning to explode, especially during the Industrial Revolution. The day God delivered me, you know, from complexity and helped me to bring things simple, he was talking to me about ministry. And and (laughs) he, he just asked me a question. He said, what was the name of Jesus' ministry? And I thought... With him. Was it Messiah Evangelical Association or what? And I, <laughs> and I realized Jesus was the ministry. It was as simple as that. Things were not as complex as this. So it, 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 over time, it's because of civilization that the, you know, those things came. So when we say starting a business, don't take the complexity away from your mind. It's as simple as you finding what people need around and providing what people need. And it could be as simple as water. It could be as simple as food. Okay? It could be as simple as candlesticks. It could be as simple as shoes. It could be as simple as transportation. We need to simplify it. Okay? I find out that uh, the system of education that we inherited in our country was designed to support the Industrial Revolution. So it was designed to produce employees en masse to work in the large industries and factories that were being produced during the Industrial Revolution. And that's unfortunate for us because there is no Industrial Revolution around here. There's, <laughs> we've only had industrial destruction the last few decades. So we're producing, our school system is producing people who will work efficiently in industries and factories, but the factories are not there. So, let's take it back to the simple level. Okay. So, the challenge I have now is that somebody comes out of the school system with this complex thought, I need to work for somebody. I need to find an industry or an organization in which to work for somebody. But there are basic needs. Basic needs all around. That need to be met. The meeting of those needs has been left now to people who don't have much education. The people who are best equipped to invent and innovate to meet those basic needs have their heads in the hair looking for someone to employ them. So, it's the people whose minds have not been corrupted by education who have their minds free enough to identify those basic needs and to meet them. They are the ones who are vocalizers. They are the ones who are mechanics. They are the ones who are willing to sell basic things around. And some of them are making more money than those who went to school and who are looking for jobs that are not there. Amen. This country is a powerful market 
waking, waiting to be awakened. 140 million people with basic needs that should be met on a daily basis and everybody despises them and goes after the money coming from just one resource. But prophetically, I'm announcing tonight, the structure has changed. See, the businesses generated by the needs of these 140 million people will soon overtake the money made from oil. It is when the 140 million are poor that what they are buying and selling will not count. As God prospers them, I'm telling you, you will leave the oil and come after them. Amen. The structure is changing. So for us, therefore, who are entrepreneurs, what we need to do is look around at people's basic needs and begin to meet those needs. Identify the needs that fit your gifts and skills and values. Identify the needs that fit your gifts and the skills and values. You are already wired to meet certain needs. Just find them, that's all. And be willing to start small. Okay? Leave this deceptive thinking around that throws around big figures. You make 50 million. Make 100 million. Oh, yeah, that's okay. You can make that from just one business contract, from supply contract from the government. You can make 250 million. You can make 500 million. But there's no future there for everybody. There will always be that kind of business, but it's going to become a very small part of our economy very soon because only a few people can take advantage of such businesses. Okay? Don't be in a hurry. Identify people's needs. Identify the needs that fit your gifts, your skills, and your values. Okay? Look at existing products and services and simply improve on them. That's the basic way to start. Look at existing products and services because most of those needs are already being met one way or the other. And just improve on the way those needs are being met or improve on those products and services. It can make starting a business cheap. I have, okay, I bought some shirts from a member of this church. A lady who resigned her job from a bank and began to make shirts. And the first time You know, she showed me the shirt that she produced. I was surprised. I was surprised. I mean, fine quality. She gets the materials from outside the country, and then she makes them the things that make a shirt a shirt. Okay? The professional touch, the lines. Everything was there. And then what blew me away was the packaging. The branding. The packaging. World class. So I began to patronize her business. Okay? She improved. I had tried before. But then just found out when you are used to good quality, it's difficult for you to go for anything lower. But then she did it. She's improved on what's done around here. She got the equipment. And you see, what was left to people, like I said, who were not that much educated before, she as a graduate got into it and pro- began to produce fine shirts. Okay? She sent me a text message a, a few weeks, two weeks ago and said, you made me proud. I saw my shirts on you on Success Power. And she knows that's going all over the world. If anybody asks me, I'll tell them where I got the shirts from. I'm marketing. Really very proud to put those shirts on. Because they're good. 
they speak for themselves. Okay? So, let's look at existing products and services. That's what I'm talking about. Some of us have heard me talk about the fact that most of our food, the way they've been cooked since I was born, is the way we still cook them. Okay? I've talked about the fact that I like corn, but I'm tired of buying corn by the roadside. Because I don't want people stopping by to ask me if anything is wrong. If something was wrong. Who was driving with me the day we went to Canaan land? You know, some, was it a little, sometime last year. And um, I said, oh, I was hungry. I said, I want to buy corn. I, I usually, of course, it's the cooked one that I prefer. And I find it difficult to buy it on the road. You know why? I don't know the source of the water. Uh-huh. Most sicknesses that people have come from either problems with their thinking and emotions or water. Seventy <clears throat> percent of the sicknesses come from problems with the mind and with the emotions, okay? And then a good chunk of the others come from water. So I find it difficult to buy things cooked with water in this country because I don't know the source of the water. But I was hungry. And I decided, okay, I will sanctify it. All right? <laughs> and then we stopped by. <laughs> this lady was cooking corn. <laughs> and as I rolled down the glass, she said, eh? <laughs> This is the man who teaches me on television. I, uh, I can't buy corn anymore by the roadside. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you know what? I prefer to go into a shop with air conditioning. Okay? And I, I like to see it done in different ways. With different com- combinations. I like to see somebody, you know, okay, some people sell coconut with uh, the corn. Okay, that, that's one side. That's one possibility. Okay, I've, I've eaten out of this country. I, I bought corn on the cobs, they call it, and with butter. It was buttered. It's sweet, isn't it? And we can invent different things like that, isn't it? You know, millions of people eat fresh corn in this country every year. Don't you see the... Cubs on the road, by the roadside during the rainy season. Now, the point is that I can afford to pay 500 naira for a cob if I like it. Why doesn't somebody sell it there? And then we can preserve it and sell it even during the dry season. Because during dry season, then nobody eats any corn. And what you then do during the dry season is uh, add a little more money to it because it's a little bit more scarce now. That's all. Amen. So we can add our university education to the cooking done by the roadside and take this thing to a new level. Am I right? Not everybody wants to have his car, his car tire repaired by the roadside. Not everybody. Not all of us can afford that. You can create problems by the roadside. I don't want to do counseling by the roadside. You understand? I'm praying prayer of impartation, you know, on the roadside. Okay? Some of us want to drive into a workshop. Okay? <clears throat> Good. So please, let's open our eyes. Okay? It was a small jar of oil that the prophet used. That the prophet pointed the attention of the widow to. To start our business. And there are many areas like that that the Holy Spirit is going to pop open. Ah, you will find your area. I said you will find your area. Everything that is called a problem in this country is going to become opportunities for you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Find a business to start. Identify people's needs. That's the greatest skill that you need. How do you identify people's needs? Just look at your own needs. Other people are like you. You need food, they need food. You need water, they need water. You need a house to live in, everybody does. The important point, don't be a consumer. Don't just be a consumer. Be the one providing the product or services. And if you're a student, then I want to encourage you, open your eyes. Every other student in your school or in your class has the same needs that you have. 
If you need textbooks, they need textbooks. You need notebooks, they need notebooks. You need biro and, and, and eraser and pencils and wherever. All the students in your class need them. And what we are saying is, come to the class with them and be the one selling those things to them. You're in the hostel. You need a haircut. All the guys in the hostel need the haircut. They don't need to go to town. Trim their hair. You know what I observed? Satan is a bad Satan. I'm not suggesting there could be a good one. But <laughs> this guy is really bad. So you have someone who is smart enough, maybe on the campus, to be the one. When I was on the campus, there, there were guys, students who brought films to the school. Showed films and took the money from fellow students. Okay? And then what we'll do is, may, maybe there was a student selling bread, and we would create derogatory names for them. <laughs> may bread. <laughs> or gababa. You, you, you want to tease them, but they are taking your money! Amen. So don't mind the appellations. You go ahead and be the one pro- providing the products and services and use your campus for the hazards. Because the real thing is coming. Amen. The real thing is coming. Find a business to start. Secondly, research and evaluate your idea. Research your idea. Just go on a research. Find out. Be practical. Okay, while your head is in the air getting revelations, let your feet be firmly on the ground. You have to deal with things the way they are. Okay, go around and ask questions. Do people really need what you want to offer? What specific problem is your product or service going to solve? You have to identify it. That's the heart of everything. What specific problem am I going to solve? Or is my product or service going to solve? Who will buy my product or service? That's important. Who's going to buy it? Is it men? Is it women? Is it students? Is it young people? Is it old people? Is it professionals? Okay. Is it business people? Who's going to buy my service? Why will they buy my products or services? Why? You have to be able to get that. You are getting to the root of it. Why? Will they buy mine? Where will they buy it? Where will they buy it? Some things they will buy in shops. Some they will prefer to buy online. Okay? Some they will buy in salons. Where will they buy it? Because then you know where to go so your seed or position yourself. What do I need to charge to make a healthy profit? What do I need to charge to make a healthy profit? Pricing can be technical. Pricing can be very technical. What do I need to charge? Will people be willing to pay that amount of money? Sometimes when you look around, do all your calculations, you can abandon a line of business altogether or you may have to rework everything and restructure your product completely depending on the affordability of what you are offering. Will people be willing to pay for it? What product or services will mine be competing with? What products or services will mine be competing with? You need to check it out. I want you to understand, even as a pastor, even as a minister, that it's this entrepreneurial thinking that I apply to the things that I do. Because it's the mindset with which you take over Canaan. In Canaan, you are not a slave. In Canaan, you are not working for somebody. You work for yourself. Okay? In Canaan, you have to be productive. The raw materials are there. You have to be able to create wealth. So it's important. What did we do with church? We innovated. That's it. And decided to go one step ahead. One step ahead of what you get around. (laughs) I remember the first time at a former location that I announced to the church, we're changing the church. We're changing the warehouse. Said we're going to put carpets, we're going to paint the whole place, we're putting suspended ceilings, we're putting spotlights, we're putting air conditioners. Some people walked up to our church administrator after the service and had serious questions. Why is the church going to waste so much money on a rented building? If it was our building, it would have been understood. Why are we going to waste that kind of money? 
Then, when I asked at church and church, I found that it was the business people in church who were asking those questions. You see, it wasn't as common as it is now to have church or the church very beautiful and air conditioned. So, he said, so why is the church going to waste that kind of money? So I asked the church administrator, I said, as business people, have you been to their shops and offices? Have you seen how beautiful their shops are? How air conditioned they are with fine carpets? I said, if they think that's okay, and I said, almost all of them that I know are in rented buildings. If they think that's okay for their businesses, why do they think it's too much for the house of God to look that good? Okay, because we were creating a new level entirely. Okay? So, let's just improve on what is being done ahead and we are going to take over many of the areas of businesses around. Are you ready? To own an airline. To own an aircraft manufacturing company. Don't think it's difficult. They are going to come looking for you. Ah, someone say amen. How much lobbying did Joseph do before they invited him to the palace? So don't think it's going to be difficult. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Let's move on. Calculate your costs. And this is very important. Calculate your costs. You have to be very, very practical. Very, very realistic. Factor in all the money you will need until the business breaks even. Many businesses crash because people underestimate how much they need. They overestimate the profits they will make. They underestimate how much money they need until they break even. Then they get stranded in the middle. Calculate your costs. Next, write a business plan. Write a business plan. Write a business plan. We're going to start a business school before long and we'll um, be taking classes specifically on this is your how to write a business plan. But I want to encourage again, don't let it be a complex thing. Okay, you may read a book now on how to write a business plan and become discouraged because it's very technical. But the businesses we need to start here now are not as sophisticated as the ones they start in the United States. Some of us, yes, and, and we can learn from the business school. Can, there are software on the internet, there are software we can buy around. But for the average person, keep it simple. Write the name of the business. Okay. Really, if it's corn, you want to sell. Why should you make it complex and sophisticated? You understand? Okay. <laughs> then write your vision. What this business is going to become. The number one provider of cooked corn in Nigeria. Okay. Your vision. And then write your assumptions. That's the answers to those questions you asked in your survey. Okay. What problem am I going to solve? Write those assumptions. We see this, what they call it, market gap. We see this need not being met in the market. We're out to meet it. And then these are the people who are going to buy. This is why they're going to buy ours. These are the products we're competing against. And this is why our own product is different from theirs and all that. And then... <clears throat> do your projections for sales and profits. Do your projections for your sales and for your profits and, and be very, very realistic. Like I said, don't rush. This is a new generation. It's a new template entirely. Don't put yourself under pressure. Okay? What you are building is transgenerational. So don't be under pressure to become a billionaire in one year. Okay? It's going to come in cycles and it's inevitable it's going to be huge and big. Be realistic. Give yourself time to break even. Okay, don't put yourself under too much pressure, especially in the first year. Alright, let's go on. Identify sources of financing. The next stage. Identify sources of financing. Identify your sources of finance. Where is the money coming from? Number one, savings. Your savings. Okay? Your savings. This is critical, especially in an economy like ours. I want you to understand global economy is being restructured now because while the credit system is good, it's been abused. 
and it appeals to man's selfishness. If you don't have a good grip on how to manage money, you will have serious problems with managing credit if you need it. Um, somebody said to me, and I adopted that as a philosophy, and I see that truly rich people, that's a philosophy for them, that's a principle. The best time to take a loan is when you don't need it. Did I say that again? <laughs> You see, the revelations from the reforms in the banking sector in Nigeria today show that while thousands of people have applied for loans for 100,000, 250,000, 500,000 naira, and they never got those loans, there were people who were getting 500 million, 5 billion naira from the banks. Let me tell you something, because some of our bankers in church told me several years ago that while people looking for small money couldn't get them from the banks, the banks were running after some wealthy entrepreneurs, pleading with them to take loans. Isn't that interesting? So, what puts you in such a position? That's what I'm talking about. The best time to take a loan is when you don't need it. At that point, you're not taking a loan as a slave. You're just leveraging because you have money that you don't want to touch. You have a new line of business. You don't want to use your money for it. You want to use the bank's money for it. And then when you, make the, when you sell whatever you want to sell, return their money to them. You don't want to use your funds. It's not because you don't have money that you took the loan. You just use it as leverage. That's all. You, you negotiate the best interest rates. One. Number two. You have backup resources. If something goes wrong with the business, you can quickly cut your losses, pay them off their money. Amen. For some people, once something goes wrong with the loan, they're finished. Bankrupt, and the bank will be after them forever. They almost die. Out of pressure. Okay, so, your savings. You must just develop that capacity to save from every income. It It gives you tremendous leverage. Save your money. If you can use your own funds, fantastic for you. You won't be under any pressure. I've seen people who borrowed money. They told me. And when they couldn't pay back and the banks were after their necks, they couldn't sleep. Those who sleep were hallucinating in their sleep. I know someone whose wife woke up. You know why? He was punching a, an imaginary calculator in his sleep while he was murmuring. He was sleeping. His wife had to wake him up, honey, honey. I hope everything is okay. He was calculating, punching, while sleeping. You can get money from your friends and relations. Most times they are interest free. That again is a big plus. What does that require? Credibility with your friends and relations. If you loaned 10,000 before, you didn't return it. Now that you need 100,000, go somewhere else. Okay? And people easily conclude, it's stingy, it's very stingy. That's okay. If you didn't find the money by the roadside, they won't want to part with it easily. Your assets can be very useful. Your assets, okay? You have three cars. You can do with two. Sell one, use the money for business. Sometimes you may even sell your TV set. And do the business. When the business gets going, you will buy a bigger TV set. You see, if your esteem is tied to material things, you won't let them go while you have fantastic business ideas that you need to fund and to grow. Somebody approached one of my mentors and was complaining, a pastor, that she didn't have money to start, that she needed help. Okay? It was my pastor. And he just looked at her and said, I can see the money on you. You have the money. He said, I don't, I, if I have the money, I will not come. I don't have anything. He said, I can see it. The gold on your neck, sell it. Okay, you can raise funds from your suppliers. You want to begin to sell cement. Okay? And somebody has his whole warehouse full of the cement. He too is looking for where to sell it. You approach, you take 50 bags of cement, and you tell them, next week Friday I'm coming back, I'll pay you your money. We call that sales on return. There's a lot of that around. Again, what you need there, credibility, integrity. That's where you realize that integrity is as good as cash. If you will ever succeed in business on the long term, sir, keep your promises. Keep your promises. It's as good as cash. Okay? Keep your promises. So your suppliers. In that instance, you are not using your money. You are using your suppliers' money. And then the bank, finally. 
Last of all, you can finance your ideas from the bank. But please listen to me clearly. You must have developed sophisticated financial management systems before you take loans from the bank. Especially with the interest rates that we have in this country. I don't, some people have weaknesses with money. Once they have any small opportunity to take loans, that's what they go for. Loan money. So here, we don't have, therefore, people who need small money don't get money from financial institutions. So we have people who have borrowed a lot of money from other people. And I'm telling you, it's a bit more difficult around here than those who borrow from institutions in the Western world. Why? When you borrow money from individuals, especially people who are close to you, you can lose your honor very easily. I'm telling you, creates problems in relationships. It's part of why I have a personal policy not to loan anybody any money. That's really because of my job as a pastor. I'm not a banker. I'm a pastor. <laughs> I can pray for you. I can bless you. I can release the anointing on your life. Now, I can give you money that I can give without having to think whether you will return it or not. But loan, count me out. <laughs> because it, it, before long now, if I, if I send you a text message, how about my money? Say, <laughs> Come and see the text message that I got from pastors. I was the big deal. What's the big deal? And with all the blessing of God on his life, start harassing somebody for ordinary 100,000 naira. Okay. Next, do your startup paperwork. Do your startup paperwork. I mean, talk to a lawyer. Register your business. Talk to a lawyer. Register your business. Talk to a lawyer and register your business. Okay? And then next, advertise. Let people know you're starting. Let people know. I don't mean go on TV. I mean let the people, <laughs> the exact people that you expect to patronize you, let them be aware. And be very creative, be very innovative about it. Okay? The man who refuses to advertise is like a man who winks at a girl in the dark. He knows what he is doing. The girl doesn't. <laughs> and then the last thing. Start. Start. And loads of people who have done everything we have talked about until now. Except the last one. <laughs> Do what? Start. Some people want everything to be perfect. You'll never start. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4. In the Living Bible, he who waits for perfect conditions will never get anything done. And you know the reason why many people fail at this point? It requires courage. Most people don't have courage. Their lives are ruled by fear and self-doubt. And they look at someone who's tried it and who is doing well, and they have a feeling the person is a special person. The person is not. Look at the person. doesn't have two heads. She doesn't have two heads. She's exactly like you. And God is no respecter of persons. The only difference is that the person tried. You never know what you can do until you try. Attempt it. I have more respect for the person who tries and fails than for the person who has never failed before. Because he or she never tried before. There's a nice way to avoid failure. Not to do anything. And you see, it even makes it easy for you. Because those who try and who fail now, you can talk to them. You see what I was saying? You see what I was saying? It's not easy. You see what I was saying? The person who tries and fails is closer to the answer than the person who has not tried at all. Am I right? Oh, yes. You want to succeed in business, for God's sake, make failure a learning experience. What's the big deal? Around here, fear, fear rules the culture. Fear. fear. Everybody's afraid. Af afraid of what? And especially because of the strong belief in witches and wizards. So once something doesn't go right, that's it. The enemies are at it again. Everybody has enemies. If that's the definition of enemies. That the thing didn't work out the first time. All of us have enemies. Because the world that we live in, there's no guarantee things will work out the first time. It's not a perfect world. Even in prayer. 
prayer, even prayer. Jesus taught us that we should learn to pray with persistence. The illustration he used was that of a man who went to his friend in the middle of the night because he had a guest and he didn't have food at all. He went to ask his friend, give me food. I just had a guest, there's no food to give him. The guy said, excuse me, I'm on the bed. I'm in bed now with my kids. And I can't come out to do nothing. And the guy stayed there. And continued to knock. So when his friend saw that both of them were not going to sleep, he gave him the bread and told him to get lost. So Jesus said, even if he would not give him the bread because he was his friend, he gave him the bread because of his persistence. And he was teaching prayer. That's prayer. So I don't know what else you want to do that you, you will assume that this will work out the first time. Elijah prayed seven times on Mount Carmel before the rain fell. Israel went around Jericho seven days. On the seventh day, seven times. Naaman went into the river seven times before his skin was healed. So what's the big deal? If you try it and it doesn't work, try again. Just change your approach a little bit. I have lost the fear of starting. And I found out <laughs> it's not always as bad as it seems. I'm telling you, try it. Help me to tell the person sitting next to you, try it. I'm, I'm going to organize seminars. That's what you've been saying the last four years. So now you have become an expert in talking about how to organize a seminar. You've not organized one. Organize it. <laughs> the first time Pastor Nika was to try a real woman seminar, was to start, she was talking about it, and then I said, look, let's go, let's try, give it, let's try, and then she decided to use a small place. It was called Big Chef on Allen Avenue. It doesn't exist anymore. The place could take like, say, I think some 60 to 70 people. Then she, she informed people. And then the day came, the seminar came, and then the place was packed out. Some people couldn't even get in. The place was jam-packed. Wow! Hallelujah! Listen, you don't have to tell people how many people were there. Tell them that people couldn't even find space to come in. You remember the proverb, the lizard that fell from the roko tree and nodded his head. He said, if anybody will not congratulate me, I will congratulate myself. It's not easy to fall from an roko tree, you understand? And someone who was there at that first seminar... Then came to Pastor Nika and said, you know what? The next seminar will be at Sheraton. You know, she just screamed and said, Sheraton, where will I get the money? The person said money. I'll pay for it. You just don't know the miracles that are waiting for you until you start. Nobody will fund your standing on one spot. They will fund what they see working. You will be surprised the resources and opportunities that will come to you when people see you working. And doing something. That's it. So the next one, she organized it. The banquet hall would sit 350. 600 people showed up. I'm telling you, they had to go get more chairs because people were pouring in. That's it. And that was just the second one. Ah, some people's miracles have been waiting for four years, five years, six years, while they were planning to start a business. Planning to. And I've discovered nobody rewards you in this world for planning to. They reward you for what you have done. But I've not seen anybody that they gave PhD for planning to study mechanical engineering. <laughs> Let me close from Deuteronomy 28. Remember, it's a prophetic word. Deuteronomy 28. As you make the bold move. Deuteronomy 28 from verse 2. And these blessings will come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your hearts, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. That means your business is going to prosper. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. 
In other words, your mind is going to be fruitful. You'll be getting ideas on a continuous basis. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. I stand here tonight as a sent one from God to declare no policy, no law, and no being, whether spirit or human, no official, however high ranking, will ever be able to stop you in the fulfillment of God's agenda for your life. If you believe that, say a powerful Amen. No principality or power that has been able to stop previous generations will be able to stop you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. He said the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses. Now listen to me. There's a difference between a basket and a storehouse. There's a difference, sir. There's a difference. When you're an employee, you can have a basket. But when you have a business, you have a storehouse. When you have the capacity to build systems, then you have a storehouse. When you can employ 100 people, 500 people, 1,000. Now that's going to be the measure of prosperity in this time from now. <laughs> it's not just going to be, I started my own business. It's going to be, well, I have 200 people in my employment now. I have 1,000 people in my employment now. I have 5,000 people in my employment now. Somebody here in the next five years, I have 10,000 people in my employment now. If you believe that, say a powerful amen. He said, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. He will establish you a holy people to himself. <laughs> you will be different. People will see you, they will want to become Christians. In the mighty name of Jesus. Verse 10, then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. <laughs> and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground. In the land of which the Lord swore to you to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure. Ah, you will get intangible wealth. Real wealth. Wealth that previous generations on this continent never knew. <laughs> While they were stealing through corruption, there was a kind of wealth they could not find. Did I hear you say amen? God is unleashing and releasing that wealth now. The Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body. Verse 12 says, The Lord will open to you His good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Say a powerful Amen. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only, you shall not be beneath. If you believe it, say a powerful amen. Stretch forth your hands towards this communion table. And declare in the name of Jesus that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, you have access to unlimited wealth. I want you to declare your freedom from every curse. Freedom from every limitation. Declare your access to the power of blessing. The you that, you shall be, that should have been poor, the you that should have failed, died with Jesus on the cross. A new you resurrected the day Jesus resurrected. If you had been an ordinary Nigerian or African, Satan would have been able to hold you. But now you are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all principality and power. I want you to declare tonight that you have power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and that nothing shall by enemies hurt you. Declare that your sins are forgiven, that you are free from every form of condemnation, that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. Declare that like Joseph, whatever you do prospers because you have a prosperous mind and there's an anointing that goes with you from today. Someone here becomes more prosperous than his employer, than her employer, like Jacob. 
Whatever laws may change in this nation from now, it will never affect you negatively anymore. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. While I pray over this communion, if you're here tonight, your lifestyle is not right with God, you want to say, Pastor Sam, I'm a sinner, I want God to forgive my sins. Jesus paid for your sins on the cross. I'll ask you to put your hand on your heart as I lead everybody in prayer right now. Uh, if you've been a Christian before but backslidden into sin, I'll ask you to also put your hand on your heart as you rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. Now, if your hand is on your heart, please say after me, Heavenly Father, I declare tonight that Jesus paid for my sins and I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Everyone, please stretch forth your hands towards this communion table as we pray.